So we have another speaker now. So uh, this is going to be challenging. Piotr Savcinski. <laughs> Savcinski. Wow. Okay. You Polish and your surnames full of consonants. So thanks a lot. So we have another Kenosis, Simpson, and the Kabbalistic ontology of the Finnish. Thanks, Piotr. And yeah. Right then, thank you very much, guys. Hello, just tell me, please, if the connection is fine and if you can hear me. Yep. That's great. Okay, so greetings from Poland. It's very nice to meet you all. Thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, participate. Uh, it wouldn't be possible in person, perhaps, but it's very much possible through MS Teams, so I'm glad to be here with you. And uh, well, as the title suggests, and as Nicola has already mentioned, I am going to propose a humble confrontation of Jewish theology and Christian theology, especially some motifs taken from both these theologies. Uh, I hope this confrontation will be of interest to you, and if you will have, uh, if you have any questions, I will be uh, more than happy to answer them after all. So. Let's get it started. Uh, the subject matter of my paper, as you can see in the title, is a Kabbalistic notion of Tzimtzum, uh, already present in some medieval rabbinic texts, but uh, elaborated, reinterpreted, and especially popularized by the modern Kabbalah, uh, particularly the 16th century Kabbalah of uh, Isaac Luria and later on his disciples, for example, Sabbatai Tzvi, uh, generally perhaps the most influential school of mysticism in, in all the Jewish history. And this inconspicuous term, which in Hebrew stands for contraction, or sometimes it can be translated into English as shrinking, in Lurianism, roughly speaking, refers to some original gesture of God, who, uh, before the very act of creation, is said to have withdrawn himself from the primordial uh, pleroma in order to create nothingness, an empty void in Hebrew called kenoma, out of which all finite beings were uh, later on going to be created. And now, in my paper, of course, I not only seek to reconstruct the idea of Tzimtzum, but I also propose its strong misreading, as Harold Bloom calls it, to argue that at least on certain conditions, Tzimtzum might be considered as a Jewish response to the Christian idea of kenosis, meaning God's sacrifice for the sake of mankind. And in this misreading that I would like to propose, the novelty of Luria's invention uh, would be twofold. First, uh, it definitely consists in shifting the canotic aspect of deity into the domain of creation to differentiate it from the Christian framework, wherein kenosis belongs only to the sphere of revelation and then redemption. Uh, creation usually being an expression of God's sovereign power, uh, the very height of heights, we might say, from which the kenotic Christ must then fall. Second and more importantly, whereas in Christianity, the self-humbling of the incarnate God and then his radical sacrifice, I mean sacrifice of life, puts on human beings some irremovable burden of remorse and makes their finite life hopelessly guilt-ridden, the Judaic sacrifice of Tzimtzum, unmarked by this outrageous blood tribute, seems freed from these repentant connotations and rather stands, I argue, for a welcome move of God who depletes his sovereign power to literally make some room uh, for finitude. As such, I further argue, it may serve as a non-humiliating arch model of ethical generosity for the sake of the other, worth meditating on and perhaps even following. So, uh, let's get down into detail and let me start by briefly reconstructing the Lurianic cosmology uh, to outline the necessary background of Tzimtzu. Well, Luria basically mirrors the Bible in insisting that initially the cosmos was entirely filled with divine presence and as such it was perfectly undifferentiated. 
now the explanation of the passage from this primordial state uh, to the world of individual beings has always been challenging for Judaism. Medieval Kabbalah, for example, tended to use the language of emanationism, where at some point things just pour out of God. And this ensures they are separate, but also contain an element of divinity. Rabbinic Judaism, on the other hand, has always accentuated the absolute separation of God and the world and assumed creatio ex nihilo as the only genesis of earthly beings, which avoids falling into uh, pantheistic formulations. And now what makes Luria stand out in Jewish Kabbalah is that he generally accepts creatio ex nihilo, but he refuses to faithfully adopt it as a dogma. Instead, he examines the original ambiguity of Judaic creation, namely how to reconcile the existence of perfect divine substance and something as extremely negative as nothing. This dilemma brings Luria to a paradoxical but highly logical conclusion that creation out of nothing must have been preceded by creation of the nothing itself. And from this, Luria explains through the concept of Tzim Tzum how God manifests himself in the world. Uh, rather than simply revealing himself externally in his full glory, God first withdraws to just one point of himself. And this radical self-reduction aims to generate a void in Hebrew called Tehiru, a reservoir of nothingness out of which or uh, all earthly beings are going to be created. What is left in Tehiru, the void, is only the remnant of contracted divine light, which Luria calls Reshim. And this receiving of God within himself is for Luria necessary to make possible the existence of independent, non-divine entities. But the main problem here is that the notion of Tsimtsum is far from unambiguous and has been interpreted in some highly conflicting ways. The first way is to be found in some of Luria's disciples, who read the cosmic process in a clearly gnostic fashion to argue that Tsimtsum is not the positive origin of finitude, but quite the opposite, the original source of negativity. Uh, we might say divine art mistake or the founding act of great cosmic catastrophe, which, of course, results in a deplorable isolation and in imperfection of the finite world brought to existence by the weakened God. Another possible interpretation elaborated especially by the Christian Kabbalah of Jacob Behme and then adopted, for example, by German idealists, to mention just Friedrich von Schelling, sees Tzimtzum not as a contraction away from the point, but rather as a concentration to the point, an essentially egoistic act of self-creation through which God first makes the room for himself as God and only later on for some other beings. Uh, this understanding of Tzimtzum is clearly not about the renunciation of power, but rather about self-empowerment and the establishment of God's absolute potency. However, uh, Gershom Sholem, perhaps the greatest 20th century theorist of Jewish Kabbalah, accentuates that the actual Lurianic idea of Tzimtzum could not be more distant from this cathartic uh, interpretation. Although Luria himself did not leave behind a single word in writing, that's the problem, and we can only guess at his intentions from the works of his followers, Sholem is convinced that only a more benevolent reading of this self-negation is compatible with the rest of his Kabbalistic system. And that's why he says, quote, by positing a negative factor in himself, Luria's God liberates creation, unquote. So, such an explanation of Tzimtzum, not as a concentration of the divine present, but um, the disappearance, the activation and weakening of his power to be, is not yet so much different from the pessimistic, gnostic reading that I have already presented. Uh, however, these gnostic overtones, still to be found in Sholem, are later on mitigated by those Judaism-inspired philosophers, who mentioned here, for example, Hans Jonas, Emmanuel Levinas or Jacques Derrida, who find in Tzimtzum a distinct ethical potential and seek to misread or reinterpret it 
in a highly affirmative way. In such a misreading that I dare to follow in my paper, uh, the moment of divine self-reduction for the sake of creation is the farthest possible move away from the catastrophic idiom. It's rather a selfless act of divine benevolence, the primordial expression of his generosity, or as Levinas put it, puts it, just a loving gift. In other words, the regression and separation are not something to be deplored and then messianically mended, but rather something to be affirmed as the necessary condition of a true, although always imperfect, creation. The creation which endows the world with some ontological autonomy. Even more importantly, as I have already suggested, this affirmative, both non-cathartic and non-catastrophic vision of Tsim seems like a challenge to the Christian idea of sacrifice, the paradigm of which is obviously kenosis, self-humbling of God, whose diminishing and renunciation of power may only happen at the cost of his life. This way, let us notice, although Christ, de Christ depletes his sovereignty, the passion paradoxically establishes the sovereign moment of Christianity. Uh, from this moment on, Christians will not cease to be haunted by the outrageous thought that people are both guilty of his death and unworthy of this arch sacrifice, the sacrifice marked by blood. Uh, to work through the trauma of crucifixion, Christians, I would say, need to somehow sacrifice their own lives to commemorate their God's death. In other words, God is only brought back to life in the community of believers by an endless mourning. So, Whereas the Christian kenosis tends to make the experience finitude burdened with the original guilt, Kabbalistic equivalent, Tsim at least in the misreading I dare to propose here, is a pure gift which does not make human life guilt-ridden. Uh, it's the act of, shall we say, moving over to make room for the other. Or, to finish with a humble psychoanalytical re reference, while kenosis is fanatic, Tsim would be more of erotic, meaning life-serving. Thank you very much. That's it. Uh, that's the end of my short talk. And uh, as I said, I'll be more than happy to answer any of the questions you might have. I just hope it was interesting to at least some of you. Thank you very much once again. That's a lot. Yeah. So, questions? She claps, but I see also questions. Okay. So, uh, Piotr, thank you very much for your talk. Uh, it's very, it was very interesting. My, my question is regarding a kind of um, um, uh, consequence of your talk for the problem of evil. Because um, you say uh, by creating the world or cre creating nothingness, as you said, um, God, in, in a certain way, creates imperfection. So wouldn't it imply that um, from this perspective, God is for, for evil? Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Very interesting, fundamental question, I would say. And yeah, the problem of evil was of, of, of primary importance also to the Kabbalists when they created their cosmology. Uh, again, the answer is not simple because, as I said, there are some disparate interpretations of, um, of, of, of the creation, and there are also different views of, of the origin of evil. One of them is like this. Evil is necessary in this world because evil has always been there, but initially it was an element of God. It was an element of divinity. I mean, there was both good and, and evil in God, but God didn't want to be both good and evil. He wanted to be just good. So what did he have to do? He had to like expel this evil out of himself and put it in this world. And that's why this world is flawed, but it's the price 
we need to pay for our good God. Okay, so that would be this cathartic interpretation, which says that actually evil is necessary. Another one, this may be more positive as I they're proposing here, but also ambiguous, is that evil is a kind of a side effect of the creation of finitude. I mean, okay, finitude must be something different from God. It doesn't imply that it's going to be evil, but if it's going to be different from something perfect, it must out of definition be imperfect. And well, during the process of creating this imperfect world, something wrong happened. Yeah, and that's why this world is not as good as it was, as it was supposed to be in God's, uh, in God's mind. And uh, that's why all this cycle of creation, revelation, and then perhaps redemption is needed. So I don't know what way it's better to follow in the interpretation. They are definitely conflicting. I would say that the one which is right now more philosophically um, productive uh, is the latter one. For example, uh, but in a very controversial way, Hans Jonas used this interpretation, I mean the interpretation of weak God, God who deprived himself of power to create the world as an explanation why the Holocaust happened, right? It, it couldn't not happen. God was too weak to prevent it, but that's the price we need to pay for our, our uh, autonomous, independent world. Uh, of course, flawed with some element of evil perhaps too much of evil. Okay, so thank you. Thanks a lot. Any other question? Questions? Mm, if, there's, if there's not, may I ask a follow-up afterwards? Afterwards, yeah. May I? <laughs> Please go. Please do. Yeah, because the Christian, one of the one of the Christians, um, the Odysseys for that, is saying that um, because of evil, because of um, God's uh, 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 the existence of evil, we can have a better good. So uh, there, there's the Felix Cooper, for example. Uh, idea the creation made available the loving relationship which is better than i mean it would be uh, a, a greater good than the existence of nothingness do, do, do you have this kind of um idea i mean i mean that because god creates the world you can have a loving relationship and uh, it reveals uh, God's nature as as love anyway in 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 in, uh, in Judaism or in the Judai uh, in the, in the Jew philosophy in the Jewish philosophy sorry. right yeah I get it thank you very much um, interesting again I would say yes and no definitely the second part of what you said I I would agree with that uh, through the experience of evil, we might also experience God's benevolence, because any time when evil happens, there is some kind of intervention, even though God is somehow uh, too weak to do it uh, with all his potency that we would expect of him. But what is very interesting is that uh, in Lurianic Kabbalah, even in its most heterodoxic interpretation, there is nothing like the Augustine's idea that, well, evil is actually good, because if there was no evil, we wouldn't be able to say that good is really good. That's why evil is necessary in this world. No, uh, I mean, for a Jewish Kabbalah, evil is always scandal. I mean, evil is always outrageous scandal, although necessary, not for us to experience the nature of good, but for us to live in the separate, finite and independent world. Is it the price worth paying? Well, here the opinions are different. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, too.
So we have a commentary in the chat. The evil, uh, the evil enter in the same moment of uh, the notion of free will. Is asking Samara Raujo. So there is yeah. a connection. So. Uh, right. Uh, not necessarily, you know, because. Um, well, first of all, as we all know in Judaism, the idea of original sin, the way we know it from Christian theo theology, is actually not present, right? So the existence of evil in this world is not kind of punishment from our wrong choices. Now, what is interesting is that in this very Kabbalistic motive that I am presenting here, evil has nothing to do with humans, okay? It's not the result of our wrong choices. It's not the result of our sins. No, it's a result of some cosmological error. It's a result of God's mistake, right? So we are not to blame <laughs> for the existence of evil. I mean, okay, later on it evolves, right? We are also to blame for our individual deeds, for what we do in this world. But there is no original sin that we need to burden. So uh, why is there evil in this world? Nobody knows, but it's not because of us. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, as we are talking about it, uh the last question. Uh, don't you think there is a too radical departure from the concept of God, of monotheistic God? Because you have a God that is weak. You have a God uh, that is uh, that made a mistake. You have a God that, uh, again, uh, is not uh, omnipotent. Uh, Hans Jonas explicitly stated it. He's a God that, uh, you know, I don't know, is weak. He's uh, made a mistake. Is uh, what else? <laughs> he, uh, weak made a mistake. I was wondering whether is the uh, is not uh, immutable because there was a mutation. I mean, there was a, a process. Don't you think it's a? Oh, according to this tradition, is a too much radical departure from uh, like the classical concept of. Uh, I mean, I was wondering what the point of praying, for instance, or was the. I mean, uh, if he simply can't act. Oh, so we gain from a side, and if it is not uh, like, especially considering uh, the last uh, part of, I mean, what you said now, if it does not look too much like a sort of uh, Gnosticism or sort of dualism, like, uh, you know, we have a good God, bad God, and uh, sorry, we have evil, which is not even depends on us. It's like a sort of, uh, uh, what do you call it? Like the dualist uh, religions, like the, the principle of evil and the principle. What do you think? Hmm. Well, right. So it's the question of how many God's features can we take away from him to still be able to speak of him as God, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, I would say that the Kabbalists perhaps would argue that their God is still divine. Uh, it's not immutable, as you said. It's not philosophical abstraction. No, God is like us. It doesn't mean that he doesn't make any mistakes, but he's much better. He tries to, uh, you know, uh, try to somehow rectify his own mistakes. Uh, but yeah, this answer is, uh, you know, uh, far from satisfactory. Uh, right now, uh, there are many different tendencies to deprive God of his potency, of, uh, of uh, you know, being omnipotent and so on and so on. And well, the question lingers. I believe that in some sense, yeah, it's a far too, uh, too much. So um, is it still the God of Bible? Not really. Is it still the God of rabbinic orthodoxy? Not really. Is it still the God of Christian orthodoxy? Absolutely not. So I would say this is a philosophically productive idea, but definitely not uh, religiously or theologically uh, valid. Yeah, I, I wouldn't risk saying anything like that. So you're right. Thank you. So Professor Taliaferro, Charles. Yes, um, thank you for this very illuminating presentation. I very much appreciate it. Um, it's on the bits about God's power. You do have um, 
the process philosophers like Charles Hartshorn and so on, you know, he wrote the book called Omnipotence and Other Theological Mistakes. And there have been personalists like um, Edgar Sheffield Brightman, who believed there was a, some kind of a surd within within the Godhead. To that, um, so there, there are these more nuanced um, portraits of of God in the in the West. But um, my question actually is about um, the Jewish Kabbalah work that you've done. Has it inherited a kind of Gnostic wariness of the material world? That is. Is being is part of the problem that we're embodied, a, a kind of lingering. You know, uh, you can think of Manichaeism or uh, uh, Plotinus. Um, there was a the Plotinus apparently never celebrated his birthday because uh, he found it very annoying that he has a body. <laughs> and I was wondering if there's an ambivalence about being embodied in the literature that you've studied. Absolutely yes, absolutely yes. And even Luria himself is interpreted in two disparate ways, Gnostic and anti-Gnostic. In this Gnostic manner, world is a result of catastrophe and it should be mourned over but we shouldn't be you know too tied to this world because the more it decays the better <laughs> in the other interpretation actually no this world is definitely flawed maybe it's even collapsed but it's all we have and we should praise it and we should treasure it and we should try to make it better so this other one is a kind of non-gnostic messianism let's make this world better the first one is absolutely gnostic or apocalyptic messianism. Yeah, let's destroy this world. It's 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 worth nothing. So absolutely, it's at the very core of modern Kabbalah, especially modern Kabbalah. And you know, as I said, perhaps at some point, one of the consequences of Luria's cosmology and Luria's Kabbalah was this uh, heterodox uh, revolution of Sabbatai Tzvi, right? Who actually said that well, we should get down to the core of evil because only in the very core of evil we might try to find something potentially good so it's uh, very risky it's uh, very revolutionary and uh, well it's something that perhaps it's not good to follow <laughs> on a regular basis but i believe it's still philosophically uh, very very productive thank you very much thanks to So, thanks a lot, Piotr. Ah, uh, why you thought the evil is separated if in the contrast of good, bad in the world? Maybe you can address the last question before we... I'm not sure if I understand it correctly, once again. Samara, can you help us here? Mm -hmm. Um, microphone to shut. Microphone, uh, microphone is to shut. Um, because you told uh, it's separate, uh, completely, completely separate of us, and I, I didn't get your point. If you can explain, because I understand this is like a contrast of good and bad in in a world, and I don't know why it's not correlated with us. That's it. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you very much. Now I I, I believe I understand uh, what you mean. It's not something I wanted to say. So if I did, uh, apologies. Uh, what I wanted to say that what is separate is this world. Okay, there must be no element of pure divinity in this world according to Kabbalists. If we want to live autonomous lives, we need to stay on our own. But it doesn't mean that here there is only evil or there there is only good or here in this world evil is somewhere else and good is somewhere else. No, this is all intermingled and interconnected, right? The only thing that I try to stress out is that the origin, the very origin of evil is not because of humans. 
right? Only this, nothing else. <laughs> and give. If it's quick, add. I don't like this VGR reponeer thing. No, it's 11, so <laughs> if it's a quick question, is it? The microphone is not working. Add microphone. Just on the microphone. It's, is it working now? I got it. All right. Uh, I wanted to. I wanted you to speak some some more about the the consequences, philosophical consequences of this view, because you you uh, you are, you admitted that there are dangerous ethical consequences. So I was thinking about the despise for the natural world, the, the despise for this world, and the consequences that this could have. And I don't think this is just a problem of this view. I think there are, for example, evangelical rapture theology views that has that has a kind of despise for this world. So I was trying to understand what are the fruits of this view in philosophical matters if, if it's such a problematic view in ethical matters. Mm -hmm. Wow, what a question. We could spend like, I don't know, 30 minutes or three hours discussing it. <laughs> I will try to raise just some issues here. At some point I said about um, two different uh, interpretations of Tsim Tsum. One as uh, contraction, another one as concentration. Some people say, those who try to interpret the Delorina cosmology, that actually this gesture was not the renunciation of power, but it was concentration of God's power to make himself. And that was very actually fruitful for the history of philosophy, because very many scholars say that what we can see in Hegel's philosophy, in dialectical tradition of philosophy, especially in German idealism, not only in Helling and Schag and uh, sorry, in Hegel and Schelling, but also in some others, is this idea, of course, uh, secularized, of course, philosophically uh, speculated, but the idea is like this: God is not finished. God is not perfect at the very beginning. God is complex. God is chaotic. God needs to make himself first to then externalize himself to this world. So it's maybe not problematic, it's maybe not risky, but it's very powerful, this precise interpretation. Another one uh, I mentioned, uh, uh, for example, in Levinas or Derrida, but also in Hans Jonas, is the idea of weak God, which uh, in the um, in the intention is rather, you know, apology of God. It's a new picture of God, God as one of us, God, God as the primary other, God as an ethical figure. But in consequences, it might be dangerous because then we can try to excuse God of all the evil in the world, saying, well, you know, God is good, but he is also too weak to prevent evil. So let's not blame, let's not put the blame on him. Let's try to fight the evil on our own because that's what he needs us to do and that's what he wants us to do. But can he help us? Not really. Yeah. So this is problematic. And not to mention the most problematic consequences of the Rianic cosmology, as we mentioned, this apocalyptic ones. Yeah. This world, it's a product of Tsim Tsum, of God's reduction. It means that there is not enough God in this world. If we want to have a better world, let's get rid of this one. OK, we don't want it. Let's have revolution. Let's have apocalypse. Let's kill our civilization. Of course, that's not what the Kabbalists wanted, but easily you can find some Gnostic overtones like this in uh, in Luria's disciples writings, because let me say once again, he himself didn't write a single word. He was only an oral preacher, and that's why we've got so many disparate interpretations here. Enough. <laughs> okay, so thanks a lot, Peter, for the talk. I hope uh, 
So we will hear about this in our future events. By the way, we are planning a number of events in philosophy of religion, as I'm saying to all our guests, like uh, maybe at UNB with Professor Agnaldo or at Unicampi. And, uh, you know, I will be very happy to hear about your works in general in these venues as well.